And camera. Hi, it's Adam from Lucid Pixel. How are you? Um, I've decided to just just say it like it is. I have recorded and edited and added motion graphics to and rendered and uploaded this video several times. I actually had a video that was set to go live at 8 30 or at 9 30 9 o'clock a.m on Saturday this past Saturday and at 8 30 I was listening to it and I decided to private it. It didn't feel ready and then a couple of hours later I decided to delete it and just it wasn't the angle I was looking for. The title of the video was do I have ADHD and I was talking about myself. The reason I made this video is because I have a son who's nine years old, who's got ADHD. I've got a partner who's got ADHD. I've got many students who've got ADHD and I've become very, very passionate about the subject because, um, well, because I want to better know my son and my students. But as time passed, I started to realize maybe I'm trying to better know myself as well because listening to their experiences, listening to how people with ADHD describe their, the way their mind works, the challenges that they faced, it started to sound incredibly familiar to me. So I made the video and, and I uploaded it to kind of as a, as a, not, a, not as a direct question, but as an indirect question to myself, opening a dialogue with all of you, many of you who I'm sure do have ADHD yourselves and say, what do you think? But something didn't feel satisfying about that angle. So I pulled it down. In the, in the meantime, I'm also reading the book, or I'm listening to the book by Ken Robinson called Creative Schools, the late Ken Robinson. He who produced that, that famous TED talk called Do, Skill, Do Schools Kill Creativity, who did pass away. And my heart was utterly shattered when I found that out because he's such an incredibly important and lovable person. I'm also going to be listening to his daughters, um, his daughter's follow-up, Kate Robinson, who did one in honor of her father, furthering on his, his message and stuff like that. So I'm listening to that afterwards. Listening to him in the book, describing his, what his opinions are, what his thoughts are of the educational system from the perspective of a very celebrated educator who reforms schools after schools after schools. He's played a very important role in education. And then having a conversation with my father-in-law, Alain, and he too, who is a celebrated consultant who's life coached people <laughs> from every walk of life over decades and decades of his life. And I had a chance to talk to him about what his school experiences were like, what his educational experiences were like. And wow, did they really sound familiar to me as well. I related to him as an intellectual, as an educator, as a student, on so many levels with him as well. Instead, I want to, first of all, share with you my, what my attitude, my thoughts and feelings about education in general and the educational system, schools, brick and mortar schools and, and such, what my, what my opinion of them are. My opinion of their necessity is that I do feel they're necessary. At least the premise is necessary. If you're a parent who's lived through two years of COVID, watching your young kids having to spend two years locked in the house, trying to experience some semblance of an ed education through a laptop, seeing how they're not getting any fresh air, they're not seeing their friends, they're not experiencing anything new, they're not stretching their legs, they're not playing in playgrounds, they're not learning how to socialize. You know damn straight that that your kid's ability, your children's ability to leave the house and go out and be able to, to experience life outside of the home is extremely important. And this is something that I'm a very, very loud advocate for. But in the same breath, um, when they come home and they complain about certain things about the school system, the way the school looks, the way that the way this, the way that the, the whole experience of being in that echoey, loud, ugly classroom, that boring prison like classroom, the sometimes having educators that aren't particularly passionate or aren't particularly kind, 
particularly to students like my son, who's got ADHD, who might be a little bit more disruptive than the other kids, who isn't in a school that is necessarily designed specifically for children with ADHD, where they don't necessarily have the tools, they don't necessarily have the resources to help kids specifically with ADHD. Then when they come home frustrated, tired, disgruntled, it's very difficult to argue to the opposite. I mean, I was raised in a world as many of us are where you go to school because, and because is the final answer. There's no, there's no why, it's just because. But listening to people like Anna, listening to people like Ken Robinson, they're not the type of people, myself included, who've ever been satisfied with because. Because isn't an answer. It's why. Why am I doing this? Give me an answer. Let's sit down and flesh this out. If you can't give me a significant why, you don't have an answer and I'm not going to respect you. I'm not going to respect your opinion. I'm not going to respect what you tell me. And if you can't give me a reason why, then I'm not going to comply. That wasn't supposed to rhyme, but there, there you go. <laughs> There's, if you can't give me a why, I won't comply. Adam, 2022. Okay. So, um, that's my opinion of that. And through all through high school, I had to sit down in that classroom and conform to this structure for full time hours, eight hours a day, five days a week under the stress of bullies, under the stress of burned out teachers that did a shit job teaching from a curriculum that didn't make a goddamn bit of sense to me. All because you've got to all because. And when my kids, co kids come home with that complaint, particularly a child like my son, who, who does not have that dopamine regulator that a neurotypical person has, I can't justify it to somebody like him. Although I know he needs to get out of the house. Although he needs to live a healthy lifestyle. Although he needs to see his friends and learn new things. And he does. He's very blessed to have some incredibly awesome teachers. Really, really good teachers that really care about him. But these are teachers that have another 30 kids in the school. And many of those kids in that class also have ADHD as well that are, that, that, he, that, that Lucas complains are disruptive, that get on his nerves because they're so, so bloody loud and annoying. And I reflect on my own experiences in school not doing well in high school, not skipping an entire, my sec three, I completely skipped. I got an average of five. Going to alternative schools. I went to a total of five high schools. I kept going from one to another. Either I was running from bullies or I was not giving a shit or I was in an alternative school or whatever. <laughs> it was not a pleasant experience. And I was the kid who spent his entire life from elementary school onwards. I'd say from like grade three onwards, the number one accusation I had growing up was, Adam has so much potential, if only he applied himself more. And I took all the blame for that. I took all the guilt for that. I, 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 I think that having potential, but not applying yourself, is a far worse accusation than Adam is stupid. Because if I'm stupid, I accept my fate. If you know, if I if I don't have a head, I don't have a head. So what are you going to do about it? I've got square brain, right? So so be it. Um, but I wasn't. I apparently had all the gifts in the world, but he's just such a lazy prick that he wouldn't do anything with that. And that to me is somebody who's entitled. That to me is somebody who is, who doesn't make an effort. But I did. In fact, I feel like I put in 10 times the effort than anybody else did just to keep up. And even that wasn't good enough half of the time. And I felt as a result of that, that I was dumber. I was less capable. I just didn't have that special sauce that everybody else had. I always felt all through education and all through high school and, and elementary, the later part of elementary school and high school and college and university and even to my profession, that I, for some, un, for some shadowy reason, I didn't have what it took in many cases. I, although mysteriously, sometimes I did. Sometimes I was an asset to the company and everybody loved the ground I walked on and everybody celebrated me and I was, and I was, I was important. People relied on me and came to me all the time. And then other times it was, oh yeah, Adam, well, you know, I'm sorry, we're going to have to let you go. Or yeah, you know, Adam's got to go back to summer school again because, you know, he can't keep up with history class. It's just, there's Adam, oh, good old Adam, you know? And 
it was incredibly exhausting and frustrating. I always started the year with 100% full effort. My notebooks were meticulous. My locker was meticulous. I was hyper vigilant and organized. And then come around two, three months in, I just, I just couldn't keep up. I felt like I was trying to brute force enthusiasm and I just didn't have the energy. I was burning out and there was no reward at the end of all of that exhaustive effort. I was literally burning out. So how in all of that did I go from somebody who barely, who, whose, whose quote in his school yearbook was made it by the skin of my teeth, quoting Megadeth, literally, and that was a literal quote, I cannot believe I made it through, to somebody who is literally addicted, addicted to learning. I can't go a day without learning stuff. And it's not because I'm Mr. Smart Guy. It's just because learning is freaking exciting. Learning about astrophysics, learning about lighting, learning about photography, learning about lenses, learning about audio, learning about dynamic range, learning about different monitors, learning about art, learning about drawing, learning about, you know, binging on, on the art channels of other people and listening to their art talks. And I'm constantly in the state of like devouring knowledge all the time. Cats. My girlfriend said, learning about cats because I'm addicted to Jackson Galaxy's channel too. I love taking care of my cats. Um, I'm always learning shit. Where's the disconnect? Well, here's the thing. And this is the ingredient that Alain gave me when we were sitting down. Somebody who's extremely passionate, extremely smart, extremely valued, extremely relied on. He very much is a patriarch, right? And we're talking big businesses, big businesses that needed big consulting that came to him. And he would help businesses kick off. He would help people find their identity, find their brand, find their future. He said, and this is very much related to his own experiences in school, and he very much had the same attitude about educators. It, there was zero adaptability. It was, this is it. This is what you got. Shape up or ship out. It was an institution designed for people that were meant to do one thing, do it or die. And this is exactly what Ken Robinson said in his TED talk. The edu educational system, <laughs> the educational, um, the educational system is designed to produce one thing, university professors. What the hell about everybody else? If you're not a university professor, you're out of luck. You're going to struggle. If you're somebody who, who isn't wired the same as everybody else, if you're somebody who has ADHD, if you're somebody who has autism, if you're somebody who has some dyslexia, what, what happens to those people? You're wired differently. I mean, and look at these people today. Look at these people today. Look at the, the athletes. Look at the celebrities. Look at the, look at the comedians. Look at the writers. Look at the artists. Look at the dancers. Look at the, the most celebrated people on the planet right now. The people that I... You know, Jim Carrey, uh, Johnny Depp, um, um, uh, Justin Timberlake, girlfriend reviews. I just saw just just recently. I just watched an episode of Ice Cream Sandwich. Love that channel. He his latest video is about ADHD. Jack Septicai, Markiplier. I'm sure Jenna Marbles. I wouldn't be freaking surprised. She's she people who have the sharpest wit, who have the sharpest abilities. I, I imagine Stephen Fry, I know he had a lot of depression and stuff like that, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did too. There's this, this unique, brilliant gene that is this, that I associate with ADHD. People have this insane sharpness of wit, this insane, always one step ahead of everybody else, the ability to create these synapses. This is a gifted brain. This isn't a broken brain. This isn't a weak brain. This is a gifted brain. And... I look at people like that with admiration. These are my heroes. These are my role models. What happens to them? Well, they get, this, this happens to me every couple of months. Me and Jen, me and my girlfriend will sit down and we'll have a meeting with the teacher. The teacher says, yeah, he's being kind of disruptive in class. And he had a little bit of an outburst here. And he was a bit frustrated with that. And he was, you know, he's very annoyed by this. Yeah, I'm trying to cope. And these are great teachers that care a lot about him, that treat him like gold. But what are they, what the fuck are they going to do about it? They've got another 40 kids and 15% of those kids all have ADHD. She can't keep up with that race. The system is not designed for people like him. The system was not designed for people like me. And I'm, I'm very sure the system's not designed for a great majority of you guys too. 
You probably struggled through school. You might struggle with your profession. And this is the same thing that, that trickled into my, into my professional world. Which companies did I succeed in? Which ones did I fail in? I failed in those big institutional companies that expect people to just sit down, do that job and do it to the, to, to the satisfaction of the company. This is the way it's done. Do it that way. You can't do it. Bye-bye. And so many people feel like failures as a result of it. But the companies that I succeeded in? Well, any company, any studio that I worked in where I really thrived were usually the small companies where I had a lot of input and where I could adapt my own work work method to my own liking to meet the demands of the, of the, of the, of the company. And in those particular cases, I did extremely, extremely well. And I was loved and I had longevity. And even after the company, even after the department might have closed, they still kept me on the team for a little while just to help them, you know, close up shop. But the companies that expected me to shape up or ship out, ship out, do as everybody else does, or you're no good to us, I was no good to them. And they got rid of me. The other type of job that I absolutely excelled at, and it's probably, it's, it's, it is the job that I'm doing right now, and I can't imagine leaving it, is being self-employed building my own business. I started my online art mentorship back in 2015. And this art mentorship is succeeding in every single way that the educational system does not. It's a private art mentorship. And no, this isn't a promotion. My school's doing fine. You don't have to sign up. You're, you're welcome to come if you want to. I'm not sitting here. Come to my school. I'm, I'm the answer to all your prayers. I might not be. But what I'm saying is, I knew being a student in school being an art student, being a student in general, I my brain works differently than everybody else. I think differently. I, I, I just failed where everybody else seemed to succeed. And I succeeded where everybody else seemed to fail. And I needed to, to discover myself. I needed to discover who I was and what my true meaning was as an individual and learn how my brain worked. And this is the one thing that sc the school system cannot and refuses to offer because they think, well, there's just so many students, I can't adapt myself to everybody. And my answer to that is, find a goddamn way. Because the way it's working right now, as important, as crucial as your service is to society, to integrate people into society, to teach them how to socialize, to expose them to important information, to give them a foundation for their future, you're only doing it for one person, for that one percentile that are going to end up being university professors. What about the rest of us? So when I started my online art mentorship, it was private. I, I could very easily make it a public school. I could very easily teach classes of 40, 50 people. I deliberately refuse to because when I sit down with somebody, I want them to get my undivided attention. Undivided. It's me and you and my job to sit there and listen to you and learn who you are and figure out how your brain works and do my best to the best of my abilities to adapt myself to you. That to me is what an education is. It's an apprenticeship. It's like Leonardo da Vinci and his, and his, and his, the students, the small two or three students that he would take on. Master and apprentice, although I don't like calling myself a master, it's very narcissistic, but you get the idea. It's a small knit group of people that you have a connection with, that you listen to, that you care for, like a part of your family, and you guide them through, you walk them through as an individual at their pace. And you, you, you recognize their unique strengths. One of my biggest frustrations teaching in the traditional school system was I'm looking at this guy, I'm looking at the student that to me has genius quality in what he's doing, but he doesn't draw as well as the guy next to him. And then I get the heartbreaking news when I show up for school one day and he's not, his, his seat is empty. And I go, what happened to him? And they said, he dropped out. To this day, that shit makes me want to cry because I'm sitting there looking at somebody who, who I feel if he was my student, if it was just me and him, I know that that guy could grow up to be an absolute celebrated artist. That person had a unique magical quality, but for some reason he didn't fit into that mainstream and thought that he was a failure, thought that he couldn't keep up and he can't keep up with the goddamn curriculum that they throw at these students. I mean, the curriculum, the having like six finals that they have to submit in one week is absolute bullshit, torture, abuse. What quality can possibly come of that? And of course, he couldn't keep up with it. So he dropped out. And he also couldn't drop out because he didn't do well enough in French, even though he's there to study animation. 
What? Because the government needs him to, to get so many credits in French, and French is the course that makes everybody drop out. Yeah? Okay, that makes sense. That makes fucking sense. He's already been through elementary and high school history and, and language. Now he's got to go through this in, in university and college as well. When he picked a specialty, when he picked, when he picked a concentration course. <sighs> am, I, am I coming to you with a solution today? There is a solution, but it's not the solution I want to give you. It's not a solution that puts a smile on my face. Right now, the solution is a lot of these artists like Anthony Jones, like Tyler Edlin, like like Clint Kearley and Diana Kearley, like, like Mark Brunet, like Online Art Academy. You know, all of these artists online are offering an education that is substantial, but it's not offering, I can't offer a social environment apart from our online community. But that's not where you're not actually sitting down and shaking people's hands and looking people in the face and, and feeling other people's energy. Us, we need school systems for that. But as they stand right now, we need to start strongly advocating to get politics the hell out of it. And if you're going to hire a teacher to teach a class, they're not allowed to teach a class unless they have the charm and the passion and the knowledge of Johnny Harris's and Ken Robinson's and David Attenborough's and Stephen Fry's <laughs> I, I, or, you know, or Dr. Ballard's, right? The, the, the guy who discovered the Titanic. I want people like that to teach classes. Those are the types of people that, that, that create stars. Those are the type of people that can, that can make your heart catch fire. They're so good. They're so passionate. They're so interesting. Not these burnouts that, that are half of the time aren't even half qualified to teach the course that they're teaching, but because they have tenure, nobody can get rid of them. That's absolute bullshit. And if that shit continues, then in my opinion, the future of the educational system is doomed because people are catching on to the fact that this, there's a lot of bullshit that they have to filter through for the false pl promise of a diploma. And as Ken Robinson said, back in the day, if you got a diploma, people were literally lining up to, to interview you. People were lining up to give you a job because it meant something. It had value. Now a diploma doesn't mean anything because everybody's got one. The education is still a valid education, but there's no value to the diploma because it's a completely watered down reward, particularly for us artists. So we need to start redefining what an education is what it means to grade somebody. If you want to grade at all, I don't grade my students. There's no value in offering grades to my students. Growth is the reward, right? So I wanted to put this video out there, not to offer you a solution. I'm starting a conversation. Me and you, we're starting a dialogue. I want you to start writing back your comments. Tell me what your experiences are. Tell me what your life has been like. What is it like for you professionally? What has the school system been like for you? What you there's, or I'm talking to a whole community of creative people. I want to start a dialogue around this subject. This is not the last conversation we're, ha we're going to have. This is not the first video I'm going to make on the subject. Teaching is my life. It is my passion. It is what I do morning, afternoon, and night. It's the first thing I think about in the morning. It's the last thing I think about before I go to bed. This is my life and it matters to me. And because I'm here at the service of you, my friends, I want you to tell me what you need. And I think if I'm going to offer any service to you, if I'm going to do anything to help the situation, I'll listen. I'll listen to what you want. And I will use my channel. I'll use this platform to amplify your voice. All right. I had to get that off my chest. <laughs> Sorry for the rant. 25 effing minutes later. Sorry about that. But thank you for pa for being patient. If you're still here, I love you to pieces. And uh, happy painting. Take care.